Hey guys, welcome to episode 50 of the Between Two Beers podcast with Ryan Nelson. Shay, how good? Yeah, here we are. An amazing episode. Great guest, Ryan Nelson, full of humility, candid and open. We charted his journey from Christchurch as an up-and-coming cricketer all the way through to the Premier League with Blackburn Rovers, Tottenham and QPR. Two Olympic campaigns with New Zealand and, of course, his all-whites journey. We touched on his coaching career in the MLS and what he's doing now in global business with dot rugby and dot basketball. Yeah, epic to our chat. Uh, we talked about all the best stories from his seven years at Blackburn, his frustrations with the All-Whites in 2010 at the World Cup, what it was like playing with two guy Gareth Bale, Luca Modric, Harry Kane, and against Henri and Burkamp, Ronaldinho and Neymar, the time he hit on Chelsea Clinton at Stanford, and so, so many other cracking yarns from an incredible career. This episode was sponsored by Braun, Bond and Lomas, a nationally recognised boutique law firm based in Hamilton who specialises in civil litigation and dispute resolution. Disputes are an unfortunate fact of life. They happen at work and relationships between commercial enterprises or between family members after the death of a loved one. These guys, and Kieran Lomas is part of this team, he's a bloody good bugger, will help you fix the mess. If you've got a legal issue and you need some help in resolving it, then Braun, Bond and Lomas are the team to talk to. www bblawyers.nz. You can listen to this episode as a podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and if you enjoy it, please share on social media. It's the quickest and easiest way to help us grow. Also, visit our website, betweentwobears.com, for show notes and links to support us on Patreon. A huge thanks to those already on board. Enjoy the app. Ryan Nelson, welcome to Between Two Beers. Two beers, two beards. You guys got it. Here we go. Uh, this is, believe it or not, episode 50. We've made it to 50 episodes, and I genuinely cannot think of a better guest than Ryan Nelson for number 50. So thank you so much for, for being here and, and sharing this one with us. Well, thanks, guys. It's uh, it's miraculous you got to 50. but um, <laughs> <laughs> And I can think of a hell of a lot better people that, that for your 50th episode. But that's amazing. Congratulations. And uh, what um you know, I'm a big fan as well. So um this is awesome. <laughs> so Thursday Ryan's theme in on Thursday afternoon, Friday morning here in New Zealand. What what does a Thursday look like for Ryan Nelson these days? Well at the moment, pretty pretty busy at the moment, um with um the real world stuff with with work and all that kind of stuff so um yeah normally normally because 4 45 and normally come five o'clock it's jesus getting close for a bit of a vino or something so um this, this goes for about 10 minutes isn't it <laughs> <laughs> hey don't let us stop you if you need to uh, if you need to dip into anything please be our guest Get, for for all your uh, for all the people watching, if if I exit and for like two minutes, it's only because I'm going to get a whip beer or a wine. Okay, so understood. The, the way we normally start these is we talk about how we know you. So I've, this is the first time I've ever spoken to you. I've obviously followed your career quite closely, um, very closely, uh, on the screen. Um, but you kind of lay the blueprint. I went to American College, uh, Monmouth University, from 2003 to 2006. So I did four years there, and you kind of laid the blueprint for any Kiwi going over to the States. Uh, during that period, you transitioned from DC United to Blackburn, and it was a huge deal, and you kind of set a really good reputation for, for Kiwis in America. So I kind of lived in your sort of, I don't know, shadow tailwind a little bit, uh, which was, was cool, so thank you for that. But Shay, you've got a closer personal connection to Ryan? Yeah, I was um, I was lucky enough in 2012 to, to travel with the New Zealand uh, men's Olympic team to London. Um, like you, I'd never met Ryan before then, and uh, we had a, a pre-tour camp in, well, one of three pre-tour camps, actually, um, in Japan. So I, I remember I'd been given a heads up by a long-time all-whites physio, Roland Jeffrey, that, that Ryan is quite particular, and I thought... <laughs> I thought, oh shit, you know, I, I was I was kind of a bit nervous and I thought, well, I need to make a good impression because Ryan had flown out from the UK, met us in Tokyo and the rest of the party had arrived. So I thought, okay, he's arrived the night before, first morning, I'll get down to the breakfast room nice and early and I'll be in there and I'll greet him. Sure enough, Ryan comes in and I think I'm the only one, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was, I was the only one and he introduced himself, I introduced myself, a little bit of a... An interaction between and for some reason i don't know why um fulch 
Dr. Mark Fulcher, who was the doctor on tour, Roland and myself had decided we would do some sort of a weight loss fitness challenge on tour. <laughs> and I, I let slip to I let slip to Ryan. I said, "Oh, look, I'm trying to I'm trying to cut down a little bit while we're while we're on tour." And he said, "Well, you can start by getting rid of that orange juice. It's full of sugar and it's a waste of time." <laughs> and I thought, "Okay, cool. I'll take that on board." Fast forward, and you'll get to speak in a minute, Ryan. Don't worry. It is your episode. But this is this <laughs> bit of seems to be what we do. Fast forward to the first training session that day, and uh, the, the lads are, are stretching, and Ryan sort of announces to the group, hey, guys, um, this is Seamus, our team manager. He Bless him. He probably didn't know that I knew everybody else there. Um, <laughs> but he's trying to lose a bit of weight on this tour, so he's going to be joining in with the warm-ups, going for jogs around the pitch while while we train and, um, and getting after it. And I kind of – I didn't. But I thought to myself – what a great guy to take it upon himself with someone that he hadn't met before to then try and bring him into the group and, and engage him that way quite quickly. Is that something that you did often when you entered into new groups, Ryan? Well, n not very many people were as big as you back then, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. So it's more of a health exercise. I was actually very worried that we didn't want somebody carrying it. On the <laughs> um, but no, like, you know, um, from from the kit man to the physio to the, the manager, team managers and all that, they're just as important as the players. And if you can get from one, you know, the, the goalkeeper all the way down to, the, you know, kit man and everybody in between, all feeling part of the group, it just makes – the team better it's just it's more enjoyable it's um everybody's invested right and um when everybody's invested um you know sometimes good things happen and um and and ultimately ultimately you're on this you're on this planet for only a certain amount of time and you only get to experience certain things like the olympics um you know once in your lifetime so you might have a bit of fun doing it right like instead of you know so um yeah that's kind of i've always kind of had that so you well, know, you were you were lucky enough to do it twice. Yeah, re I mean, just I was just I just so lucky, and I look back, you know, you're just so lucky that um, I was in those position, positions to to do it, you know, a couple of times, and you know the the other stuff as well. So, yeah, and 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 as I said, um, I always found that um, you know, if you treat the um, treat everybody equally and treat everybody um as part of the group you know it's it's a hell of a lot more fun and they enjoy the experience as well you know they don't you don't want to feel like you're an outsider when you're not you know you're not a player or you're not a coach you know you, it's that that's can be really awkward for some for some people and um and so if you can get everybody kind of involved and all that it makes it fun for everybody so you went to two two campaigns 2008 2012 you were a premier league star at this point um and and you played Brazil in both tournaments. Uh, in the first one, Ronaldinho, and the second one, Neymar. So uh, two questions, really. Was there pressure? Did you feel any extra sense of pressure because of what you're used to experiencing in the professional game and this young bunch of sort of amateur battlers sort of having to bring them through? And then how do you help convince these guys that they're good enough to play against some of the very best players in the world at that tournament? Oh, it's, a, it's extremely yes. difficult because, um, you know, uh, the, even New Zealand football was kind of amateur and they weren't really getting funded by FIFA or, or anything like that. It's the IOC, right? So your funding is completely different. Um and so the mentality was that back then was, oh, we're at the Olympics, you know, whatever. And that used to frustrate the living daylights out of me um, because, you know, there's so many um, Cinderella stories that all sports provide. And it's, you know, fun that could be you one day that you could actually have gone on and done something quite interesting. And that's always kind of frustrated me. Back in those days, New Zealand football, they made leaps and bounds, right? You know, this is this is back then. We're talking, you know, 2008. We're talking, you know, a long time ago, um, and 12. And so, what used to annoy me is that, you know, when when the players, when you get over over that white line and you're playing the game, and there's millions of people watching with Brazil, and that there's hundreds of millions of people, they don't know that Brazil gets looked after in an absolute different way than New Zealand, and no matter whether you're an amateur or what, the preparation that goes um, 
behind it, it that's uneven. That's that's uh, against us. And so that's what frustrates me, what frustrated me when New Zealand, like, at least help the players out. We're on a hiding for nothing anyway when we get across the field, but at least help us to when we get to that white line, they can put their hand up and go, we've done everything now. You know, we've done everything to help you players. Now it's on kind of you. And they never did that, which was which was um, which I found really frustrating. And and that's when angry Ryan used to come out, is because you know we're the ones who get um, criticised or you know all that if things go horribly wrong. And this is all all the you know World Cups, everything. It's on us. And there's this New Zealand attitude that is really awesome. It's really great, and it's really bad as well. It's this is like oh we'll be right. We'll just roll our sleeves up and. Go out there. It's typical Kiwis, right? And it works. It, it's a lovely attitude to have. It's really, but it's, but at the at the pointy end, <laughs> the pointy end of a uh, world sport when you're playing Brazil, or you're playing World Cups or Olympics, or yeah, that that doesn't really, uh, that kind of really doesn't really work. And um, so um, it's it's so difficult. It's so difficult. And and when we had the Olympic guys who who not not very many were professionals at that stage. None of them were, I don't think, um, except the older guys. Um, to to kind of and, and, and which means they just want to be there as well. They they take that mentality from you know that oh we're just at the Olympics, let's go. They don't think about you know can can we actually win here? You know can we actually beat you know these teams that we're playing? Um, and so it's a whole mentality change that you you. You, it, you can't do it overnight, but it's um. But that that that's the kind of one that that would used to frustrate me. It used to be so difficult, but trying to bring everybody together is just is the one thing that at least the players can kind of control that I could control and the staff and everything like that, and try and use it as a positive. If you know what I mean. With with your psychological tricks, you would you. I mean, you were obviously a senior leader in the team. You weren't coaching the side, but I'm sure you had a huge influence in the changing rooms. So again, focusing on Brazil. You're, you're playing against Ronaldinho or Neymar. Are there are there tactics you use? Do you mention them by name? Do you focus on how good they are, or do you just sort of totally ignore what they're about to produce? Um, for, for the Olympics, that was tough. Like you know, the World Cup was different. Um, they're all pros. They're all, they're all well, my journey were pros, but the Olympics is really hard. Like you know, you can't. And when you go against those guys, they are some of the greatest players that have that have ever graced the field ever. And no matter what I say or what you do, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm not, you know, I can't even get near that level. Like, it's just a ridiculous standard that is so high. Um, so psychological warfare, you could, you could, <laughs> you could do everything perfect and get smashed by um, these guys because they're just, you know, who, the, you know, God, whoever she is, just bless them, bless these guys with just stuff that um that you know no matter what you do you can't you can't do anything about. But you did you did draw one all with Egypt in 2012. Chris Wood scored after 17 minutes, and Mohamed Salah scored after 46 minutes. I think it was he was 18. He was an unknown 18 year old Egyptian at the time. Do you remember playing against him in that game and thinking shit this this boy's gonna have a big future? No, not at all. Um, I can remember when he was at Chelsea and he was rubbish. Um, not rubbish, but he was all right. He was never wanted to worry about. So back at, back then, no chance. No, he never thought he'd be what he is. Um, but but the game beforehand, I think we lost 1-0, was it? In the, um, in, no, in the 80th minute. Was, I can't remember. It was late, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. So this, this stuff used to annoy me. And, and afterwards, because you kind of know it happens, right? So... Just imagine if, if New Zealand put a bit more, New Zealand football put a bit more preparation in, you know, because we're all flying economy. We're all just, all the preparation's pretty, you know, all these other teams have way better preparation. But just imagine if we got the preparation that all these other countries did and we held out against Belarus and we nicked another one and we won against um, Egypt. Uh, we go on to the next stage. And they're fine. Like, that's a fine line. That's little old New Zealand getting out of the group. And um, now they, they are way better. New Zealand's way better now, I think, you know, with, with Danny involved and everything, way better involved. And I think I think 2010 World Cup actually kind of changed the mentality of a lot of New Zealand football because they never thought ever 
that a senior group could ever get out of the group. But but the, you're so close, and we were, we were close in 2012. Like it's it's so frustrating that when you look back, you go on. Could we have done things different that might have changed the you know the the margins by one or two percent, and that one and two percent could have got you a two one win and a one and, and a zero zero draw or something like that, you know. So, yeah, yeah, that was a good team. Two thousand and twelve. Yeah, Smelts, McGlinchey, yourself, Chris Wood, Costa, Rojas, Tony Smith. Great team. You know? Yeah, like that, that. That's a, that's a good. That's a good Olympic side. There was um there was there was one player in there Ryan and we we referenced them on Neil Emblin's podcast a little while ago which was um, Dakota Lucas I don't know if you remember Dakota I don't even know if you remember there was a training ground kind of situation where he he had a little pop at you um, and one of the things we've kind of found through one trying to bait you to get on the podcast but also research the podcast is everyone kind of has a Ryan Nelson story. <laughs> I'm really interested if Ryan Nelson remembers any of these really memorable things for other people, or they all just kind of blur into a bunch of stuff that's happened in your Absolutely life. Absolutely remember it. He, he was making these kind of little errors, and I kind of said to him, mate, you know, you can't do this. You just can't do these at, at training. Just can't do this. Please don't do it. Like, you know, just come on, come on, come on. Then I made I made a mistake, and they scored. And he goes, oh, what about you? You've just made a mistake. And he's right, but I kind of, I kind of went to him. I said, "Look, I know for I know one hundred percent for sure that when it comes game time, that's not going to, it's not going to happen to me. I, I won't do it. You know, but you, you, you know, you're, 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 you have the biggest crowd you've played against is probably a hundred and two dogs. Like you, you know, like." So and he had a big, you know, to pop at me like, "Why are you saying that to me?" And then you go and do it. Yeah, get it. No, totally get it. But I know I'm not going to make it. Can you guarantee you're not going to make it in front of sixty thousand or in, in, in hundred million watching? And yeah, so no, and fair, fair play on, like, good on him. He, um, you know, I had no problem with that. Um, but I don't think he got the, um, <laughs> he got what I was kind of mentioning. But um, that's life, you know. <laughs> That's 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 really nice. There's uh, but, uh, there's a couple other kind of Olympic nuggets which have come up at various junctures and various episodes. So oh, no. I'm kind of doing a little bit of fact checking um, with you here, but I can't recall because I went into a haze of grey after it concluded. But were you witness to the cheeseburger eating competition between oh, me yeah. and Roland Jeffrey? Were you oh, there? Right. Oh, I was right there. Like, what? You're not going to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was one of the ones that ordered the 154 cheeseburgers. <laughs> that seems that seems that seems, odd, that seems at odds with your uh, journey to help him on his weight loss. Nah, that was all out. The, <laughs> it was all out, that was all out the window in the village. You do what you want in the village. Oh, I go to the village, stays in the village. Like, you know, cheeseburgers and all. Um, no, absolutely, that was phenomenal. That was you know that should have been if you, somebody recorded that, that would have been yeah. epi that's that's episode fifty gold dust, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're gonna jump around a little bit, Ryan. I've I've been calling some of your old contacts in Christchurch over the last few days to find out what you were like growing up as a teenager. And one of the guys I spoke to knows you really well. Said that I said you know. 15, 16, 17 year old Ryan, did you know, could you see at that point that he was going to go on and have the career he had? And he suggested, well, not really, because we, a lot of us thought he was actually going to be a cricket player. He suggested that you captained the New Zealand under 18 cricket team. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I tell you what, if there is um, there, if there is a heaven or a hell, whichever one I go to, I, I hopefully you can, um, you can ask that person, I'm going to ask that person, can you just tell me what would have happened if I chose cricket? And because cr cricket's arguably my number one sport, I kind of like you know I love. I just as a fan, I've just been I've just watched every ball um, of the first day of the New Zealand Test by the the, the second Test. Period. I I just love it. I love cricket so much. Um, playing it was um, a bit different because um, you know I just I. I, I needed to move and I needed to run. I needed to, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't there to, 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 to do that. So I probably didn't have the mentality in terms of just that patience, that kind of 
that mental patients just stick around for that amount of time or whatever. But I just, I love the cricket. Uh, you know, all the cricketers I've met, they're all great guys and and um, and just love the sport, love New Zealand cricket and how their, their journey's gone. So, um, yeah, if as I said, if I ever, if, when I die, which would be probably pretty soon, um, I'll probably go. <laughs> I'll probably go and ask the person. Can you just show me what would have happened if I if I chosen cricket? I probably would have failed and and ended up uh, starting podcasts with two beard guys. I don't know. Never know. <laughs> what, what sort of characters were knocking around in that New Zealand under eighteen team with you? We were. What, my one was like the Daniel Vittori, the um, Daryl Tuffies, the Marshall brothers, the. Um, you know, all that kind of um, era. Jacob Oram. Jacob Oram was a really good goalkeeper. Mm. Uh, superb goalkeeper. He could have he could have probably had a had a good little he's probably saying the same question. You get Jacob on, he's probably asking the same thing. Well, I wonder I could have gone if I took chose football. So, well, do you remember a specific moment where you had to decide which path to take and you decided to walk away from cricket? Yeah, it was um we played the net cricket uh, under eighteen national tournament and um and we played Northern Districts in the final, and um, they had they were loaded. You know, Vittori, the Marshall brothers, Tuffy, um, Cunis, Stephen Cunis, Bob Cunis' son, um, loaded, really good. And um, I ended up getting, I think I got, I got, I think I got ninety nine not out actually, or something like that. And we got two third, two two twenty or something like that, and we ended up winning. And I ended up, I was the captain, and ended up being picked as the team as the captain. And then, and then to tour, I got picked to tour England with the New Zealand under twenties uh, cricket team. But the, the soccer scholarship kicked in. I got a scholarship to America. So I had to choose. And um, stupidly, um, I kind of thought I'd messed around academically for my whole my whole career. So I need to get a degree. I had a dodgy knee. Didn't think my knee was going to hold up. Um, I need to have a degree or some sort of um, kind of foundation or, or, or to fall back on, right? Uh, you know, and, and my knee could have gone. You know, the, the surgeon said that you shouldn't be able to play another football game ever again. It was it was not good. Um, so I thought, shit, I need, to, I need to get an education. And, and I had never even even looked at academics. You know, I was, a, I was an idiot. So I thought, you know, pull your head in, come on. So, so I chose that path. Well, that, that seems pretty extreme. What was the injury that caused the, the, the knee? Uh, I, I'm told it was a 100 mil split in the femur just above the knee. Is that right? What, what happened there? Yeah, done your research. Yeah, it was a big, big chunk of um, bone cartilage had come out. So, um, and I couldn't get it back on. So it was just purely a bone on bone glass. Um, by the way, that injury actually made me a lot of money in the end. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that at some other stage. But um, yeah, it, um, it, um, it was just bad. It was just bone on bone. It was just pain. And so every every game I played, I was I was in bits. So and that was at eighteen kind of thing. So. And I understand you wanted to go to North Carolina, but missed out on a few by a few decimal places on some class ranking or something. So you ended up at Greensboro. Is that how it went? No, no the uh, the lady at UNC Chapel Hill, that's where I was going, um, missed up my because um, I didn't have very good grades, but I had a I had a pretty high what they call SAT um, score. So that so I got on that and then but she didn't um, calculate my grades well enough and I didn't didn't get she thought I was going to be cleared through this thing called the NCA clearinghouse which I wasn't so I couldn't play for a year so they were going to honour my scholarship but they said well you just got to go over down the road to Greensboro and then just come back and you can get your fulfilled scholarship so but I was you know I was quite academically I wanted to do academically quite well and so I I dug in and, and got away and did really well and then Stanford kind of said, Hey, you know, now now you now you might be able to get into us. So I was like, oh okay. <laughs> UNC, you can do one. So so that was through the, the Bobby Clark connection, right? Yeah. Um was he your he was your coach at Stanford? Yeah. Yeah. And he was and a company of Dylan, Simon Elliott and Jared Davis were there. And so so in terms of trailblazing the university one, those guys were were before me. Um, they they are the real trailblazers. They kind of, you know, there's a guy, Jordan Depew, who I played with Christchurch United. He went to Harvard. And so all those kind of stories kind of 
um, got on my head and kind of, oh, that was amazing. And then w w when you see that, you know, as you guys probably know, when you see the university set up over here, it's just phenomenal. It is phenomenal. It leaves everything in New Zealand, um, unfortunately, you know, just, just with, with all the, the, the facilities and the professionalism and how it's run, it's just phenomenal. Stanford and Harvard, Ivy, for those who don't know, Ivy League schools in America, they're the top of the top, the best and the brightest minds. I had heard a rumour that you might have been in the same year as uh, Chelsea Clinton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I tried to um, I tried to pull the moves on her one time. Um, <laughs> I was at, at a party, you know, and I didn't really know who she was kind of thing. They just said, oh, go on, go on, dance with her. And I was, uh, she was like, I was like, yeah, give it a go, you know. So I was like... And I thought I was on point as well. I, I, I had the dance moves going, I good banter, you know. I thought, man, this is I'm on here. Like this is this is she wasn't she was kind of like uh, and I was like, Whoa, what's going on here? You know, and I stepped it up another level and I and, 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 you know, like because I don't normally have good banter at all, but I was like, Jesus, <laughs> I'm on fire. And um and I felt like a tap on the shoulder. <laughs> this big monster guy in kind of like, you know, mufty gear which just said, you know. Come on. And it was one of her bodyguards. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Amazing. I did I did the best moonwalk um out of <laughs> that you've ever seen. Were there others across that those two years at Stanford that have gone on to be some of the biggest and brightest stars in the world? Yeah, like it was pretty cool. I mean, like Tiger Tiger Woods used to come into the medical center sometimes and used to see him and like you know, you know, oh, there's so many, like I can't, you know, I can't really think of names right now, but um it just it's just this utopian, like it's it's kind of fake. It's so nice and so conducive to excellence that it just you know, it's just phenomenal. Like, you know, virtually every everyone kind of goes on to start companies or work in mm -hmm. their life. It's just and it's only because of the environment. You know, the hardest thing is to get in there. Actually, when you're in there, it's actually not, the, the academics are not hard, but they just produce this environment that just creates this excellence that just that just takes you from, you know, if you're a kind of a, a C, C to B to A, it's just, a, and you off you go. It's, um, I learned so much, not, not, not more just that, more just environment, the, the, the way that they did things, the way they thought, the mentalities, you know, like it was just, Everybody was a winner is not the right right word, but everybody was just motivated to excel. So it was it was cool. And so so you're you're excelling academically, but at the same time you're forging a very very successful football career as well as a collegiate athlete. At what point do you start thinking MLS Super Draft and all that, or are you torn between a career and and as a real person as you are now and an athlete? Yeah, ne never thought of um, professional football. I, I I got a scholarship. Um, I managed to get a scholarship to um, uh, law school. Um, so you have my law school pay for. So um, I was going to go um, to Stanford Law, and they said um, the, the person said, "Look, go go out in the real world for a year or two, and then come back." It's, you know, it's the way they should do it. You kind of you know get a get a few miles kind of under your feet first, and then come back. So I was like, oh, okay, and then there's some investment banking stuff. I got a few jobs in investment banking, and then um, offers, and then um, and then out of the not out of the blue, but I kind of got um, picked in, in the first round um, off um, MLS, and so I was like, oh, maybe playing soccer for a couple of years would 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 be pretty cool. So um, yes, I took that. And even yeah. that, when I went to MLS, I was still going back to law school. Right, you know, I was just waiting for that. I was just waiting for them to find out that I wasn't actually that good and I'm just going to head back to law school. It, it seems like, I mean, we kind of glossed over how well you did at Stanford. You, you went there in your junior year and you were MVP that first season and then you captained the team and you were All-America in your senior year and then you picked up number four in the MLS draft. But like these are very incredibly high achieving sort of accolades for, for an American athlete. Um, that... That success, it seems to have followed you on your career up until then. It seems like everywhere you go, it, it seems like you were just a, a straight success and you were a captain and a leader and you did really well and you went to the next stage. Is that how it went? Were there any failures across that time that it, it, perhaps we're painting a more rosy picture than, than it was? Absolutely. Uh, there's way more failures than there were successes. I can tell you that for, for free right now. I mean, oh, 
um, so many insecurity, so many doubt, so many you, you, you know, like um, so many bad games that you know. The the one thing that I probably look back at is maybe it's maybe it's my um, I don't know just being like, stupidity or something in my brain or something like that. But I never let failure. Failure was always a way of getting better, and I kind of embraced failure, I suppose. Um, and instead of letting it get to me or go down. And then everywhere I went, you know, um, always people said, what are you doing? Like, you know, you're, it's, it's a wee bit too hard or, you know, like that. And that kind of was like, oh, you know, well, you know, let's have a go. It's, 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 you know, I'm going to prove that wrong. Even my, even my father, when I went to Stanford, I got to Stanford, I called up my father and said, oh, I've been accepted into Stanford. And even my dad goes, oh, you bit off, bit off more than you can chew there, big guy. Like, <laughs> He's right, and so you're like, oh, shit, okay, well, I better let's, let's try and let's try and do something about this. Um, so, so yeah, so you know, I mean, I can't, I can't, you no, know, way more failures than, but, but I turned that failure into a into a success pretty quickly. Um, that was probably one of my one of my big strengths is that I could, you know, go from failure to well, whatever success is termed um, pretty decently quickly. So let's follow the journey. You go to DC United, four years there, success, success, success. You leave after winning the MLS Cup. Uh, I think it was their fourth time they'd won it. You were the captain of the team. You were the main man. Did, at this point, were you thinking, okay, I'm going to have a career, I'm going to have a long career as a professional footballer? No, not at all, because my knee was um, – my knee under an MRI literally blew up, um, blew the machine up. It's just, it was just awful. Um so I was waiting for that any day, any training. I was waiting to just explode. So, so everything was just a bonus. Like, oh, I made it through this training. Got got one more. You know, like oh, I made it through this game. We got one more. Um, but we played Blackburn in the in the summer, and they they the the scout there picked me and kind of said, oh, you know, do you want to come over at, at some stage when you you know do your contract? And they said my contract's about to end, and I got offered a, I got offered about. 250,000, which was the highest paid to be a defender to stay at DC. And um, I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty decent. But then law school, I mean, you know, that, that would set you up for life. And then Blackman said, just come over and try it. So I was like, what, what, what harm is that going to do? So um, I went over and trialed with Blackman. And I was there for a, just a week trial. I was actually with Charlton, Charlton as well, because um, – um, I went to Charlton first, and they literally put me with the academy, and I trained with the academy, and then and then five days they said, "Thanks, you know, you're just not good enough." I was like, "Yeah, no problem. I get it." <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so so then I went to Blackburn, and I had a week trial there, and, and so I went for a week, and then I, and then I was just waiting for them to say, "Nah, you're not good enough." And then um, they said, oh, "I can stay for five more days." I was like, oh, okay, you know, I'll stay for five more days. And then after that, I said, can you stay for one more week because we've got a game? And then stayed for a week, played another game. And then Mark Hughes like, look, can you just stay for, um, we've got five more days or something like this. And I was like, yeah, okay. So stayed that. What I found out later was was because it was like um, end of November at that time, that they were just trying to keep me there at Blackburn and so I wouldn't go trial anywhere else. And so I already knew they were going to, Offer me a contract, but but I didn't know that, so I was sweating bullets for freaking three weeks while I was training at Blackman, and then they offered me like a um so they so my agent went and spoke to them and they said okay we're going to offer him a contract um we've done is we've done a scan and his knee is horrendous we can't, <laughs> we can't give him a contract we can't give him a contract as his knee and in the end they talked to Mark and they said okay we'll give you a six month contract to the end of the season. So, because he's from New Zealand, MLS, you know, yeah. well, New Zealanders can't make it in the Premier League. So I got a six-month contract from Blackburn um, for, for you know, not for, for very, very small money for a Premier League player. And I was like, yeah, buzzing. Like, you know, if I can – six months? Yeah, no problems. If you had, if you told me six days, I would have signed. No, awesome. <laughs> and, then, um, and then after about – I think it was about the seventh or eighth game at Blackburn, they made me captain. And then <laughs> – and then I was a free agent after six six months, right? So I could have walked anywhere. So my knee, my knee had to give me a, if they'd give me a three year, I'd have been stuck on that money. 
So my my uh, my knee helped me out with my knee so, association after after like two months at the club. I'm really interested in this trial period because a few guests that we've had on before talk about trialing at football clubs in their teenage years, 17, 18. You're 24 and trialing. What is it? What does a 24 year old trialist look like? It's not like you're having to. Are you having to do stuff that trialists would normally do? Pick up balls and all that sort. Of, it's really perplexing kind of position to be in. I kind of did that anyway. I used to, I used to stick around after training. Like, uh, you know, I kind of enjoyed just, uh, you know, it was a great experience because um, the pressure's hard because you've got to literally be your best every training uh, on a trial, right? Like, and so I really feel for when I was when I was playing, I, um, you know, you had a contract, you felt for trials coming in. But at Blackburn, like, you know, I can, I can remember the captain at the time, Andy Todd, was a centre back and – and I was, they said, okay, just having a, having a game, you go. And so there was like three centre backs. So I went out to right back, you know, right back. And then Andy Todd goes to me, the captain of the club at the time, he goes, right, you're on trial. You're a centre back, right? I said, yeah. And he goes, no, you come in here and I'll go out to right back. You play in your position. Wow. And that's from me taking, you know, competition for his spot. So like, there's some really classy guys that, um, that you kind of came across as well. It's not all. You know what? What you kind of thing is they, you know, they make you do all crappy stuff and all that. The the the, the, the team that I was with, there were yeah, there's some eggs. There always is, but there's some really classy guys that like like that situation. So. And are you that in that six month period that you first signed? Did you squeeze your first FA Cup semi final in that period? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Did we? We went and played Arsenal, I think. And yeah, yeah, it's like a Cardiff, right? Yeah, yep, that's right. Yeah, that was pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty interesting um, experience. Yeah, that was cool. I think I is that where I I think I broke my broke my um, hand for that or broke my thumb for that. That was a that was an interesting one. Like I um um my first game at Old Trafford was was Man United and we're zero zero in the in like the eighty second minute and I and I was with Alan Smith and um, the Manchester United striker and I fell down and my thumb went bang straight into the ground and snapped my uh, thing. So my bone was coming out of the, the thumb. And I knew it was hurt, hurt, and it was going. Alan Smith saw it and said, oh, you're, you're, you're struggling here. Um, and so um, so what do you do? It's um, it's it's probably your one and only ever game that you're ever going to play at Old Trafford. Um, and so I'm thinking, it's the 82nd minute, 0-0. Zero, zero. Do you go off because you've got a sore thumb? Like, it's a little more than a sore thumb, isn't it? If it's, <laughs> if it's perforated the skin, you, yeah, you, you might have reason, but I gather you played on. Yes, yeah, I know, but it's like it's one of those ones like I can never be here ever again. You know, what is my grandson going to say when when he goes, "You walked off at the age of old Trafford"? <laughs> you, you know, so um, so played on, and I can remember, I can remember we got zero zero, and the coach kind of goes, "Okay, guys, go out and do a warm up, warm, warm down now," and I kind of see them up. And I, I've got a bit of a sore thumb at the moment. He goes, "What? Get out there!" And I kind of showed him, and the guy nearly threw up. He was like, "What are you doing? You're an idiot!" <laughs> so yeah, it's funny you say, "Yeah, this will be the only time I played Old Trafford." You ended up going there every year for the next what eight years? <laughs> <laughs> wow, at the time, I didn't know, right? Yeah, but you you were also like on the transfer radar for some of those bigger clubs, like Man U and Arsenal at some step. What is that? People throw that you th that line gets thrown out in media. What does that actually look like in reality? Is it agent club talking to agent club talking to you? How does well, that? They, they, they talk to you. So um, one time um, at Man U, I don't want to bore you the story, but um, we we played at Old Trafford and um and I knew Manchester United were a wee bit interested or something like that. But um, but we played Man U. We lost, I think, three one or something. Like that. I can't remember the score. I was awful. I was the worst player on the field. It was an embarrassment. I was crap. And we're walking in and um, I got picked as man of the match for Man United's away player man of the match. I'm like, what? what? Even the guy, the players were going, what? <laughs> you know, so the, the steward leads you, leads you up and you go into this room and, and all these Man United, you know, um, uh, season ticket holders are clapping you. An ex-Man United player, Brian McClear, I think, comes and goes, oh, you know, you look great, Man United, you know, blah, blah, shaking your hand. And you go, next thing you know, you hit the coach, your assistant coach. Oh, you know, you, you, you'd be great. You know, you think, how are you doing? You know, they, and it's literally all it was was Ferguson sets up an interview process. 
And so wow. they get to know you, they get to talk to you, hey, you know, what, the, what do you like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and so I've, got, I've still got this, this Man United um, big bottle of champagne around the, around the corner and um, for probably the worst game I ever played in the Premier League. But it's, it's what Ferguson did to, to try and see what, just, just get into the, and, you know, see if, if, the, if he's a good guy or, you know, blah, blah, blah. They got all these people to talk to you. And then they, you know, just part of their um, process. It was pretty cool. But I was on, I was on the radar of, of, of Man City. Um, I was, they took Julian Lescott over me. Um, it was going to be, it was going to be me, but they took you in this guy. I was always, I was always the one guy. I was always the next option um, from their number one or two pick, and I was like the next option. Um, but um, they, the, the, most of the feedback, Ferguson, I spoke to him one time, said that um, on all the analytics they did, there was two guys that defended the box the best in the Premier League, and that was um, John Terry and myself. So yeah. that's, that's how they got to. Um, but then they worried about my pace if um, if they played a very high line and they and they kind of went one on one at the back. They were they were worried about my pace. And that's I was like, fair enough, yeah, I'd be I'll, I'll you were worried? I I was shit myself every time. <laughs> um I'll just take a step back, right. when you arrived at Blackburn, um you've come from DC as we said. Some of the personalities in that team, I was looking through the squad list 2004-05, Robbie Savage, Dominic Mateo, Morden Gamps Pedersen, Brad Friedel, Brett Emerton, Craig Bellamy, two guy. Like, is that an insane step up in quality from what you had been playing at at DC? Yeah, of course. Oh my God, yeah. Um, but, um, but, but the, the, you know, like when you... I'd always like be so daunted beforehand, but when you kind of train and when you get out there, I always kind of thought, I always had a bit of a confidence that I, I felt like I was the best, like I, I was, which I never was, but I kind of thought I was. And so I, that, that kind of never worried me when I was out there and, and playing and and you work hard, you do the right things and and that you kind of, it, it, and people say this all the time, it's actually kind of easier when you're playing with better players. Um, you know, they make you look good because I used to give, two guy all sorts of crap passes and he would just kill it and make it look really good <laughs> like so it's like the good players make you look good i mean I, and and even the next level is when i went to tottenham with with modric and bale and those guys i mean that was just a hot uh, yeah hot. we're gonna we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. <laughs> get there. um one of our previous guests called tinkler who you, was an olympian teammate of yours said yeah. he roomed with you once um and he's a huge blackburn fan and he just kept asking you questions and wanted to know as much as he could and he said you've got some incredible two guy stories which we'd love to hear i actually went on a little two guy rabbit hole on youtube what a place. this morning if you get a chance listeners go and watch his best 10 goals and his best 10 assists for blackburn unreal insane but what was he what was he like as a character Oh, he's phenomenal! What a, what a man! Like what an amazing man! Um, he would at halftime in the, in the Premier League games. Can you imagine this now? Um, he wouldn't be the coach. Mark Hughes, Mark Hughes, you know, playing Arsenal, which just would a big team. You know, he's not there for the halftime tour. And and where is he? Where is he? And what he had done is he'd gone to the toilet. He'd stand on the toilet and he had taken out the smoke alarm and he's having a cigarette. And he's blowing it up, the smoke up into the fans. <laughs> he needed, needed a couple of cigarettes at half time. <laughs> oh my God. What a guy. That's the way it was. Now, now, now everybody could say, I mean, you've heard this so much because, you know, if, if he didn't smoke and he probably looked after his body better, would, would he been at the bigger clubs? Maybe, maybe not. But, but might have taken his personality away on the field because, you know, that's just who he wants. And, and there's some, some. I think these days, that's kind of coached out, right? That's like kind of coached out of a lot of players. Some of their kind of individual personality. There's a lot of um, a lot of players that are very much the same. I, I feel, and that kind of personality is kind of gone a wee bit. And and you don't want to kind of you just don't, for me, you don't want to coach anything like that out of out of him because that's who he was. And if you try to control him, he probably would just go downhill pretty quick. But, but in terms of talent, no, he was up there with the, the Modrics of the world and, and all that. Did you see some stuff, like I said, you, you're watching these top 10 goals he scored in games. Did you see some insane stuff in trainings that you just, oh. like, blew your mind? Oh, it was just entertainment. Like, you know, you stand at the back and you just, 
it's just so much fun just watching them. Like, you know, I just, I forgot what I was doing, actually. I just, just keep watching Tugs kind of do his stuff and then he'd lose the ball and I'd go, oh shit, what about, you know, I should be in position or something like that. I'd, I'd just been watching him the whole time. But we're, it's just, you know, you can't really, um, I can't really explain it, but you just, there's just certain levels of talent that's, um, that, they, that they do that is just so natural. It's so, um, as I said, God-given or I don't know, whoever given or whatever. It's just, um, it's incredible to watch. It is just, you just know that. It's kind of like, I presume it'd be like watching a Picasso or, a, you know, a, um, you know, Eric Clapton on guitar. I don't know. You know, it's, it's kind of that level. It's awesome. Can we detour back to Cole Templer for a second? No, definitely. Were you, were, you, <laughs> were you taken aback that one of your Olympian teammates had such an encyclopedic knowledge of Blackburn Rovers and an insatiable thirst to understand what was happening at the club from you? Yeah, re really scary. Um, I, I kind of thought it might have been, you know, might might have to sleep with one eye open kind of thing. <laughs> no, he's a lovely he's a lovely man, and just you, you know, people people are interested in that. And like you know, once you kind of once you're in it day to day, it just becomes a job, and you just kind of do the stuff and all that. But people are really interested in how these people are and these personalities and everything like that. So, so yeah, no, um, you know, it's just the, the guy was just so interested. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw another bouquet out because I know he's a big fan of the podcast and he's a big fan of Blackburn Rovers. So Raj Naidu, who's uh, a Melville United stalwart, our club here in Hamilton, awesome. he will be enthralled with this episode. He's a diehard Blackburn fan. He's going to hammer me for not asking you to autograph something, but I'm not going to do that, even though I kind of just did that. Well, if I ever get to Mel Melville United, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I have a beer from them and all that. There you go. There it is. Um, there's a few other characters I want to um, ask you about. One of them is Big Chris Samba, who seems like just a, an incredible uh, player and specimen. But he partnered you at centre-back for such a long period, but then that season then became a striker. Yeah. Like, who has that in their locker? Uh, who, there? I mean, which manager would, would do that besides Sam Elvis would put him up at a striker? And um, Chris came for like 400 grand. Like, um, we were we were centre backs for a long time, and I was a free, and he was 400 grand, and that, it was ridiculous. Um, he, well, he was on trial one time, and he started dribbling through, you know, this six, six foot 20 freaking guy um, dribbling, like, and just, and it was like, you know, it was like a, the Red Sea, right? Like just smashing people away, and you know all this. And then he and he came to me, and his his touch was too heavy. And I can remember just going, "Here we go, here we go." And I can remember just seeing him, just went, "No way, see, there we go, big guy." Just keep <laughs> going. He was, he was intimidating, man. Um, but um, no, really, really good guy. But that was that was when we had we didn't have very many strikers at the time, and Alois Alois just wanted to go long, and um, and he wanted somebody to hold it up. And we had, I think, uh, was it Andre Oyer or something like that? Um, the Dutch centre back was there, I think, at the time. I think uh, maybe Andre, another centre back at the time, and he just thought, right, you know, we've got centre backs pretty much covered. Um, um, at least just, at least just, let's just go long, hold it up, play from there. And uh, I, Chris was miserable the whole time. Uh, he, I mean, he's miserable. I've hated it, absolutely hated it. I would have loved it. I don't know. He didn't. For some reason, he didn't pick me to go up there, but. <laughs> Um, Mark Hughes obviously had a, a big influence on your career and, and did so well at Blackburn. He went to Man City in 2008-09. Did you have a strong relationship with him away from training? Did you sort of socialise with him or was it that close or was it purely professional? Nobody really socialises with Mark. He's um, a really quiet guy, really keeps to himself. He's got his own little group of friends and that's it. Um, um, but being from from Wales, he, he got a lot of probably – Growing up, he got a lot of what what a New Zealander does. So he saw, I think, he saw a lot of me and him kind of thing. Um, so you know, he he gave me my opportunity. So I'll always be in debt to him. Um, but he's just a really quiet, quiet guy. Um, the worst trainer that you could ever come across. It was a if you talk about two guy in training, think of the polar opposite, and it's Mark Hughes. The guy couldn't actually. Kick a ball. Like, it was embarrassing. It was if you did a passing drill and he would come in sometimes, it would go off his shin. It would go, it was he'd ruin every training. And then you go, you go do like some shooting, and it's like watching again Picasso paint. Like 
he would, be, you know, he was, he was 40 odd and he's smashing volleys and he's hitting his bicycling and he's finishing everything. And then he'll go to a little passing drill. It's off his knee and shin, and <laughs> it was it was incredible to watch. <laughs> yeah, you talk about um, Mark Hughes jumping into training. I don't feel like Sam Allardyce maybe jumped into too many training sessions as an extra. But in between those two, you had Paul Lintz come in and take Blackburn. He wasn't, I think, lot long after playing. Um, did he get involved in any training ground sessions as well? No, they they tried to Blackburn tried to replicate what they what they thought worked with Mark. And then they tried to get kind of like a, a big player, that uh, uh, ex-player, that good reputation that was starting his career. But that, but, but, but Paul wasn't, he wasn't a manager. And, and, and he was very, again, uh, again, like one-on-one, he was really confident in all that. He was like, you know, he's, he's, he's Paul Lynch, right? But couldn't speak in front of a, a group. Very, very kind of nervous and shy. Um, he he gave the players um, too much of a, a rope. Um, he gave. I can remember one preseason. One of uh, he, he just said, "Come on, guy, you know, go out, enjoy yourself, you know." And, and you know, but we're, but we're training, you know, like he did back in the day. And but you know, a lot of the players took that for granted and and went on a bender. And I can remember. Um, I think it was uh, Robbie Fowler at the time goes. Right, guys, I, I'm going to try and sneak in tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that. I could stop laughing. We always to try to sneak out, but under Paul, you'd always try and sneak out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was to say it was a, it was a, it was a heavy preseason dr- drinking preseason that one. I, I might be stringing along bow here, but the way you described Mark Hughes, and this is going to on the face of it, appear unfair to Woodsy, but I, I grew up with Woodsy in, in Boys High. I remember watching him for St. Paul's and things. And at times he looked a bit bumbly and he looked a bit sort of not the polished product, but get him in front of goal, get him in the box. And he was absolutely lethal. Yeah. Obviously he's better at his hold up play and his passing like than what you've described Hughesy as, but do you see any similarities there? Yeah, um, absolutely. Like could, could, could Mark play the modern game? Would he have adapted, um, you know, Probably would have. I'm not sure, but those those players are so rare that you know they just get one chance or they get all that and they score and all that. Woodsy, Woodsy it had everything. Like it was, you know, obvious. It's got everything, but there was just certain aspects of his game back then that you know just probably let him down and that kind of link up play and, and everything. And it was just you, you could see it, and it was just like so close and and um. And so, yeah, it, what, what I love about Woodsy is, again, he just he just kept going and going and going, kept working, 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 never let some sort of, not failures, but, you know, things where some clubs that didn't work out and boom, it's back in and again. And it, it was there. It was only a matter of time. And to his credit, uh, as an absolute credit, he's turned himself, well, not turned himself, it's, it's, you know, he's, he's now just, what a phenomenal player. Like, I don't think... Nobody's going to ever um, do what he's done. Like, you know, score, you know, double-digit goals in the Premier League for multiple seasons. That 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 is that is gold dust. That's so hard to find. That's you know, um, high-profiled international strikers can't do that. They, they struggle at the Premier League level to to do <laughs> to do double-digit goals year after year. Phenomenal. He does, for me, he doesn't get the credit um, he should get from. New Zealand media, everything like that, you know. And um, and I, I kind of said in another interview, I, I kind of said that maybe, you know, like me and then probably Winston, we've, we've kind of probably made the New Zealand public a wee bit numb to um, New Zealanders kind of doing well in the Premier League. Not numb, but, you know, if we weren't there and he just turned up and started doing this, oh, my God, I think the, you know, the, I think the country would be going crazy, you know, like striker. This is, I don't, you know, no, no, just to Winton Roof. But I think Winton would have struggled. Even Winton would have struggled to, at that level to do that consistently at the Premier League. It's so hard, so hard. Yeah, mm-hmm. you've you've um, you've identified that he bounced around a few clubs. He's now found a home at Burnley. The uninitiated wouldn't realise that Burnley and Blackburn Rovers have a really intense rivalry. The deal um, is. Where, where, when you were at Blackburn, um, did that ever rear its head? 
Oh my God! Was, I think it was a six. Uh, I'm just I'm guessing now, but it was, about, it was early on. It was about the sixth, seventh game. Um, we got drew, drawn with them in the FA Cup at Burnley. Holy moly! I've I never ever experienced a game like that, and it was the first time that Burnley and Blackburn had played in years. And um, you know, the army had come out, you know, to, to protect everybody. That the oh, the game was just incredible. Um, people storm in the field like one, one guy still one Burnley fan stormed the field and a, a woman police officer tried to come on the field and stop and he just went boom just like knocked her out um on the, yeah. it was unbelievable it was you know i can remember a, a fan kind of tried to attack robbie savage and, and you know robbie's the, the, you know one of the biggest he's all pretends to be a tough guy but he's one of the biggest blouses you've ever come across you know, he, ran, he ran behind the bigger guys, you know, like, and then like put his, you know, knuckles up. Um, but yeah, it was just a, oh, that was a phenomenal game. It was awesome. Yeah, we we had Paul Eiffel on talking about Millwall and their fans and kind of that oh, yeah. that scenario. It's it's kind of hard unless you've either been to a game or been ingrained in English football as Kiwis to kind of appreciate the sense of tribalism that there is for that support. Yeah, I mean, tribalism is just a really nice, politically correct way of saying they're nuts. They're just, they're, it's it's dangerous. So, it's like, Mill was one of the worst, you know, they're, they're, they're the worst. It, it is really bad. It's um, it's bordering on psycho. Um, you know, you, you'd never want, you know, it, it's a sport, right? Like, you know, and um, yeah, it's some of the, the you know, some of the abuse you get is, um, is, is pretty full on like you know you can kind of laugh about it and you know because you know blah 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 but it's it's you know it's it's let's just say it's it's not nice it's it's horrendous but um, that's that's life isn't it that's, that's what it's like there's a, there's a few more blackburn bits uh, i want to get to before we move on uh the first one is more for the listeners um than you ryan but blackburn vote fans voted on their greatest ever 11. i just want to read out the team because uh, Ryan's in some pretty uh, esteemed company. So Brad Friedland goal, Michelle Salgado, right back. Colin Hendry, Ryan Nelson, centre backs. Graham Lasso, left back. David Bentley, two guy. David Dunn, Morton Gamps, Pedersen in the midfield, and Alan Shearer and Chris Sutton up oh, yes. front. Yeah. Like when you hear your name in a team with those guys talking about, you know, you were sort of early twenties, not really sure if you're going to be a professional footballer. Do you think, fuck, I've Gave it a pretty good nudge there. Yeah, like you know, like um, I I, don't, I lost for words in all honesty um, because that's just um, I didn't know that actually. Um, you know, I'm just just I, I would have paid Blackburn to play for Blackburn. Like you know, I, to get that opportunity, I would have, I, I would have I would have paid them to let me kind of get on that field. So so to you know to and then to be putting that and that kind of um, and that group of players is um is um it's kind of you, you get a bit I, I get a bit, i'm getting a bit eye watery now because it's just um you know I, I just i just i just loved every minute of it i was just waiting for it to end you know so yeah again but lost for words to the truth is it's well, well let's let's bring you back down to earth what the hell was going on with the venkis chicken ad <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean I, that is bloody class I, we will I, we will so get it on our, uh, our website. So many people go, what were you doing? I was like, what do you mean what I was doing? I was producing some magic. I thought it was like phenomenal. Like, I'm surprised I haven't got any call-ups for, you know, TV, Shorten Street or whatever, you know. Nothing. Did, did, did you eat the chicken? Did I what? Yeah. How many takes? Um, at least to say there was a few takes that were that were <laughs> – we didn't, we didn't know, you know, like because you know, like it, it's this is like movie magic, right? Like you know, we were we 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 were ph you know, phenomenal kind of. You know, I was just, I, I'm surprised we didn't get BAFTAs or something. I don't know. But <laughs> for those who don't know what we're talking about, the Vinkies they took over Blackburn and they I don't know where the chicken ad came in, but there's a 30 second clip you can find on YouTube. We'll link to no, it. You can't. It's not. It's oh, not yeah. Um, no, we've got it. Don't he's, worry. He's got a drumstick and he's sort of walking down the tunnel and he's licking his lips and his all sorts. It's yeah. don't listen to these. Don't listen to. You. Never trust a guy with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the other the other story I need to get to is it came out in reports in 2009 that you and Al Haji Juf came to blows after a 3 0 loss uh, to Everton at Goodison Park. What do you recall about that? Um, 
I um, I what I recall about it, I think I charged him. I think I think I I think he he he, he was he was near it. He was he, I, I, me and me and I are good friends and all that. But he always used to come in and he always used to um, blame everybody else. It was always everybody else's fault. It's just how hard. She'd always just go, you know, I'm, I'm Liverpool. I've done this. I've done that. And he and he came in and just kind of blamed everybody else. And um, he went at, and then he went hard at one of the young players or something like that, saying, "You'll never, you'll never be as good as me. You'll never, you can't even, you should be cleaning my boots or something like that." And and um, the people who people who know me kind of, I don't like those type of things. That so I think I did a Superman attack over the uh, the masseuse's table, kind of like, you know, and I landed like kind of, you know two feet in front of him and, you know, he started volleying, kicking me or something like that. But, yeah, no, we, we got into um, we got into kind of, uh, yeah, it happens, right? You know, a bit of, bit of fisty cuffs, so. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I, was, I only stumbled upon that one this morning. I'd sort of forgotten about it. That thought, thought it might be an interesting aside. I gave him a hug afterwards. Yeah, we had, we had, yeah. a, we had a, hug, a hug and a cuddle afterwards. But it just happens, like, I, I, I had a couple of them were at training. <laughs> you always used to buy... He always used to blame everybody, and he always used to blame the young ones, and it just used to annoy the living daylights out of me. And he, he was, he used to, I mean, not very many people um, get under my skin, but but um, he used to, just the way he would do it, but it's just him. And um, and I think probably I wasn't mature enough in that sense to probably maybe be able to, you know, handle it a bit better. But, um, but yeah. Oh, well. We We've we've talked about a lot of the good times. Um, was one of the lower moments getting beat seven one by Man United when Berbatov scored five? Oh God! I, I thought it was like seven 0 after like sixty minutes as well. I, I thought it was going to be ten twelve. It was, and that so that game, that game, me and Allardyce went at it. So training the, the week before training was a joke. Um, all these people were messing around. We had this big six foot four guy called Gulan, who um, Sam assigned, who was this fr he was French. I shouldn't say French, but he was he was a very very arrogant guy, and he was training like crap. Um, Jabonda was training like crap. You know, they're all just messing around. And Sam always should say, "Oh, don't worry, they'll be ready for Saturday." Um, Old Trafford, you know, thirty minute, twenty minutes in, we're down three nil. Jabonda's had a nightmare. Gulan had to get subbed after 30 minutes. He was in tears. He was crying. Couldn't handle it. He was crying. He walked off crying. This big six foot six tough guy who's trying to beat everybody up during the week walks off the field because the it is an it is an intimidating place. And if you do not play well, you can the pressure, everything can it can buckle humans. And it buckled this guy. And he got dragged after 30 minutes. So half time we're down. I don't know, we're down a lot. You know, Sam Ellis comes in and goes, you know, what's happening? What are you, what are you guys doing? And so I went at Sam. I said, what the fuck do you think's happening? We've been shit all week. All these players that you've, you know, all, all these players have been training like crap. And then you go and pick them and they play like crap. And we're down 4-0. I was like, what do you think? What do you think's happening? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> what, a, <laughs> what a mistake that was for me. <laughs> Like I just saw him go red, stares at me. He's like, well, he's like, crap, Nelson, Nelson, no, you big Kiwi bastard, you're one of the, you're shit, you've been useless, you're one of the worst players here, you are, oh, and he, literally for the next 10 minutes, I just got berated by Big Sam, <laughs> it was a beauty. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I, no, I learned my lesson on that one. But um, yeah, we ended up coming out, and thank God Chris Samba scored in like the sixty or the seventieth minute or something, make it seven one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there? I mean, Berbatov scored five in that game. He's one of many great strikers you played against. Uh, who stands out when you when you think back across your your Premier League career? Who were the toughest to mark? The two, the two, I, uh, the two at the time were um, um, Henri and Burkamp. Um, when they played up together, oh my goodness! I, you know, I, I just want to bury myself. When they beat us three 0 at Highbury, I think it might be three one. I can't remember. But um, they they were beating me, and then coming back, 
<laughs> are you kidding me again? <laughs> like joking, and, and 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 I was seeing red, and I was trying to like, go, uh, you know, I, I was on the bobsled, two footing, trying to two foot them, and they were just like just walking past. It was just embarrassing. It was it was they were so good. It was like, you know, it's one of those moments where you go, oh, hey, there's a bit of a different level here. <laughs> it's like, so, so good, but in Henri's case, so fast too. The, the pace must be frightening as a centre back. Yeah, I mean, everything's frightening about them. Like, it was just, you know, everything, you, you know, it's... <laughs> it's hope they have a bad day, hope you have a good day, you know, and, you know, and then sometimes you, you do all right and sometimes, you know, but then, but then and sometimes Henri, you can just tell, he just doesn't want to play. And so he'll just chill. And then he'll turn it on for five minutes and he'll score a goal, have an assist and walk off and he hasn't broken a sweat. And... Mm -hmm. Just decides to play one time. Alan Shearer, like I got him at the end of his career, and um, you know, knees, his knees were like you know, you know, beach balls. They were just awful. There, you know, he couldn't hardly walking. He's limping, and then any ball to the far post, he he jumps like six foot high in the knees. Up, you know, his knees are up on your shoulders, and he's like banging. He's like he was so his timing was so good. It was just amazing. Like there's so many strikers who've just got so we're just so good at, at certain things that were just so elite. Um, mm -hmm. But then, but the full packages were like the Drogba's, the Henri's, you know, those guys that were just, you know, um, oh, they're just fun to all. So so you had seven years in the last season at Blackburn. I think you only played one game. You had a bit of a knee injury. They got relegated that term, which yeah. shows what they lost when you weren't there but it wasn't a great end was it to, to blackburn when you went to tottenham what, what happened there one of the saddest the saddest things that i'll ever have and um i you know it's still still really sad for me right now is um i was actually back i i i, I did the same on my left on my right knee as my left knee um i got it on my right knee as well and so i was struggling big time and good pain but i got back um <laughs> and i i played on on January like 30th, or 30th we, we played Huddersfield in a um, a warm up game, um, kind of just a just a backyard game at the training at the training facility. And I played 80 odd minutes. I um, actually scored two goals. We won four four one or something like that. Scored two goals. I felt great. I actually felt great. Told Steve Keen, the manager at the time, um, I'm back. If you if you need me in the weekend, I'm I'm available. I feel really good. I'm buzzing. So I still have my Blackburn gear on. I kind of warmed down. I, I ended up talking to the Huddersfield coach at the time, and we had great. So I got back to the locker room about forty-five minutes after the game, and kind of ended the way cleared. And I checked my phone, and I and I've got some. I've got two voicemails, and so I check. I call the voicemail, and one of the voicemail, and, they, and the the um the new CEO or whatever that goes. Ryan, um, I just want to let you know we've come to make a decision that. Um, um, for you and a certain other certain other players that um, we don't need you anymore. Um, we're going to pay you out um, a certain thing. Um, if you pack up your stuff and walk out of the training field, don't say bye to anybody, you will get a um, certain payout. I was like, oh, okay. Sure. Okay. I checked uh, my second voicemail. Ryan, Harry Redknapp here. Who did it really well in the game against Huddersfield? And I hear you might be free. Do you reckon you want to come to Tottenham? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the most saddest thing um, about my time at Blackburn after eight years or whatever like that, you know, seven three quarters of my captain, I had to pack up my locker and I had to walk out the, the training field, drive off and never never speak to anybody again. Never say bye to the fans, never say bye to the people that were at the club. I just had to walk away. And um, I drove down and then then drove down to Tottenham and I got paid out by Blackburn and signed for Tottenham. Then that same guy from the Blackburn CEO calls me, calls me up and goes, what are you doing? I go, what do you mean? And he goes, you can't do that. Goes, what do you mean? You you let release me. He goes, I didn't know you were going to go to Tottenham. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's that's so gutting, isn't it? Because you you can't ever recreate that dressing room. You're never going to get those people all together in the same place to sort of ever have that closure or that farewell. It's no, and, and, and just the fans, you know, just like you know, because you know that's why, like, it's you know, when you said about the the fans saying all that stuff about you know being in that best eleven, I never got to say bye to anybody. 
I, I had to like contractually I just had to walk away. And it was um yeah, and, 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 and in the end all those guys, the CEOs and it, they all got fired, you know, they were, you know, those just it just shows what happens when you've got um you know, certain people in certain positions can be so dangerous. It, it, and yeah, and they got rid of like probably eight of us who were probably on the higher end of the weight scale, got rid of mm-hmm. them thinking that they could bring in some young players or something like that and stay up and, and they got relegated and then you know, it's history, right? Similar, similar to the trial stuff at Blackburn, what's it like then going as a senior player to a club like Tottenham? What's the, what's the welcome like there? How seamless is it to, to fit in? I know you're only there, I think, till the end of that season and then you moved on to QPR. But um, as an established Premier League player going to quite a big club, with respect to Blackburn, what's that like? Yeah, me and Louis Sahar kind of came in at the same time. So, you know, Tottenham didn't have much money, but they wanted to kind of reinforce certain positions. So I was kind of brought in to um, just kind of help out that position. I was, you know, 35, I think, or 34. I can't remember, 35. So I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, the last little gig at, at Tottenham. And then, um, and so you go in there and the quality is just you know you talk about DC United to Blackburn or Blackburn to Tottenham's even a, a different level, especially that team. That team was so good. It had so many good players. Um, Gareth Bale, Luka Modric. Yeah, like you know uh, Van der Vaart, like you know Adebayor, Kyle, I mean, Kyle Walker, Harry well, Kane in the uh, reserves. I mean Harry Kane was you know like I used to mark Harry Harry all the time. I had him in the back pocket all the time. He's just it, I don't. I, I'd, if, if anybody tells you that they knew Harry Kane was going to be Harry Kane today, uh, you know they're lying. They're absolutely lying to you. Like it, he was, he was just a, a nice guy that was trying his hardest. But you know, I, I never saw it. Nobody really saw it. Um, but you know, fair play to Tottenham. They just kept going because they they thought maybe we could get a million or two million from a Championship club or something like that. And then next, <laughs> next thing you know. <laughs> So, uh, in, your, in your experience, is there anyone at that young age that you've seen in training or whatever that you look at and you go, fuck, this one's going to make it. He's phenomenal. Um, there, there's so, there's, it's really yeah, hard. It's kind of it's hard so, yeah, because there's so many good young players and um, maybe they get it too early and they go or they, you know, it's, it's very hard to be consistently good at the highest level and especially when... You can't play. I, I mean, I would have, you know, you give some 18 year old a big contract just to keep them at the club because they can't lose them, right? So they give them maybe five, six, seven, eight, 10, 15 grand a week. I don't know. Could you imagine you guys, and I include me in this, when you're 18 years old getting, you know, that type of money, like it, it messes with you, you know, and the families are generally, you know, no disrespect, but they, they're, they're hoping they're, they're, they're living. They want to get their life um, from that kid's money, you know. So they're kind of putting, you know, and they're taking money. Their friends are there, you know. It's so hard for these young kids if they don't have the support system and, and everything that behind them. So mm. it, it, are there many players? There's so many players that I thought, oh, this guy's gonna, this guy's phenomenal. And then a year down the road, there, this just goes like that. We had a guy, Keith Tracy, at um at Blackburn. Phenomenal player, but um, you know, kind of his family were kind of gypsies, and um, and you know, he kind of went down the road of you know, got his girlfriend pregnant, and you know, and next thing you know, it's gone. Yeah. So, so you didn't you weren't at Tottenham that long? I think it was about six months or so, uh, and then you sort of maybe surprised a few people by taking the coaching job at uh, Toronto, QPR, QPR. You missed, QPR. You, missed the you, missed, you missed the QPR. The QPR. Well, 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 I was going to re-sign at Tottenham um, with Harry, but Harry was going to get the England job, and they they told him that um, he's got to re-sign with um, Tottenham for extended year, and he said no. He, he thinks he's going to get the England job. He didn't get the England job, and Tottenham said no, we, we, we want to change it. And that's when they brought Villa Boas in. Villa Boas couldn't – make decision on me because you know so he just goes no you know he didn't know me that well so he wanted a wage and all that and then mark um mark user qpr and he said oh just come to qpr and kind of help me out you don't have to play much you know just help me out here so i was like ah oh, you know that that's cool I'll, I'll, I'll do that um we played tottenham played qpr that that day and villa boas comes up to me afterwards he goes 
why the hell didn't you, you stay? I, I would have signed, you know, you, you're ridiculous. Why have you got, you know, so, but I'm into, I'm into QPR as just a, you know, a pretty much a, a guy to help the locker room because they were trying, you know, just to be there. Next thing you know, like, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't even in the squad for the first couple of games. And then um, well, five games later, I was a captain and, and, and I'm trying to put everything together. And I was just, I was just getting exhausted. Uh, I was getting tired. I wasn't starting to enjoy football. Um, it had all been about enjoying it and like that. I can remember just standing in the in the tunnels of one game, and I was like, I just can't be bothered. I can't be bothered. Oh, no. And, and I wasn't good enough to think like that. I had to be on my game like 110%. And I can remember we played Chelsea in, in Stamford Bridge, and we, we beat them 1-0, big, you know, derby kind of match. And, you know, the fans are buzzing, and we're in the locker room, and, everybody's going nuts and all that and I just sat down and took my boots off and I was like I don't even want to be here I don't even want to be here just captain QPR to beat Chelsea and I didn't want to be here and that was that was the big moment I was like ah oh, come on mate I think we're done here <laughs> so yeah. that must that must be tough because I've, I've heard you say in a few other interviews that you actually thought you played your best stuff in those last years yeah. or perhaps even that last year so now, looking back, reflecting on it, would you do would you do things any differently? No, absolutely not. I, 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 the ir- the irony of it, I think I probably played the best some of the some of the best. I, I had a couple of seasons at Blackburn where I where I was really good when I was younger, and that when I was then, I, I was I was playing some of the best football I've ever ever played, and but I was miserable. I was I had to get myself up for that ninety minutes so much to then and then get through it, and I was just, I was just I just mentally afterwards was exhausted. I just wanted to be a family. I just wanted to be more, you know, I was, and, and I was 35 and a half, right? Like I, I had a good innings. It wasn't like I was, you know, 31. Like you, you, it, I'd missed weddings. I'd missed friends. I missed family. I missed all this. You sacrifice so much. It's not, I, I'm, I'm not complaining, but, um, mm. you know, from 21 to 35, um, you know, I've, I've, I've missed, you know, every single weekend for every, I, you have to, you have to, I have to be physically, mentally, mentally up for every single game for 15 years. Just, it's just tiring. It's just, and it, and it just hit me like a, um, like a, like a brick wall. So in hindsight, when I look back, um, you always go, when you, whenever you're not playing or when you're done, you're retired, you always go, oh man, what? Because QBR offered me um, two year extension. Two year extension, I, I was like, nah, nah, I just, but I always go back to that place where where I was, and um, and I just I wasn't I wasn't there, you know. I, I had a good run, and I don't want to be that. I didn't love the game enough to be one of those guys that goes down to the championship or goes down to League One or goes plays another year in, in um, New Zealand. I kind of wanted to um, um, I kind of wanted to just go out on a high, and and that was I was playing like playing some really good stuff and. I was done. Let, let's just take you back a few years because um, you were, as anyone in New Zealand knows, how good you were at the World Cup. And I think you were 32, 33 then. Um, but after the World Cup, I mean, New Zealand didn't lose a game. I mean, from, from the public perspective, it seemed like they had done incredibly well. But then afterwards, in the aftermath, you kind of apologised, saying you were sorry that, that perhaps you should have done more. What was your feeling following the World Cup? I think it was um, I had um, and, and the mentality at the time was that um, we weren't going to be there. We, we didn't want to be there to make up numbers. We want to actually try and win stuff. We want to actually try and do stuff. And it was so in, we, I kind of ingrained it in my own head that um, that like not winning the World Cup was going to be considered a failure. Like in my own head, I don't know. You know, like look back now, it's laughable, right? Like you know. Come on, but um, but at that time I was just um, yeah, just so disappointed that we we're so close, but we just couldn't get there. But we we you know we exceeded everybody. But just at that time, I was just devastated because it felt felt like it was we really did feel like we're doing something for the country in a way. You know, like you know, this is not just us. It's four and a half, five million people wanting to do something special, and we haven't, we didn't do it. That's, that's how I felt. I was like, we didn't, 
I didn't meet my expectations of like getting out of the group and then going and playing whoever and then beating them and then going again and going and that was it was felt like a bit of a disappointment. It wasn't until afterwards you kind of you know you kind of go oh actually it wasn't too bad, <laughs> but if you know what I mean, if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Um, tactically, in that last game against Paraguay, we needed a win. Um, we kind of sat. So was, was the game plan just to keep it nil all for as long as we can and then make like a little mini match at the end of the game? And do you would you have done anything differently now looking back? It's a real difficult one. It's been a, probably a debate that many football fans in New Zealand have, have you know talked about over a few beers, right? Like, why, why don't they go and um, why don't they go and last five, ten minutes, go and throw everybody forward and try and get that goal and and we could have lost 1-0, we could have, you know, and we wouldn't have ever been gone down in history as the only unbeaten team in 2010, you know, like, at, at that time, you know, you, you're, you're kind of in the middle of the game, you're kind of playing three jaws normally to get you, get you through anyway. Um, I, we didn't know what was going on. Uh, I don't think we knew what was going on. I didn't know what was going on, what needed to be done. Um, should... Should they have thrown caution to the wind? To debate, um, I don't know. You know, I was I was sick as a dog as well. I, I was just, I got I'd got some um, those that, vi that virus that oh god. So I was I was a mess anyway. Um, but when I look back, you know, I, actually, I hate looking back. You know, I've, I've never been a person that looks back on anything. Really, you kind of look, look forward. But um, but yeah, I, I think yeah. yeah. You, you left everything on the pitch, including your kit. I think you left the field and your undies in that last game. Is that right? Yeah, the old yeah, the old I left the old thunder pants, and that was about it. I think I don't know what happened. I, I was delirious. I think I don't know what happened. Might have been yeah. I think we, we gave some of the fans or something like that. Poor fans got all the sweaty gear. <laughs> it's, um, you can kind of understand, and hearing you talk about your, your Blackburn time as well, post-World Cup, and we, we might kind of hover around World Cup as well, but is it hard? Is it was it hard to get yourself up playing for New Zealand again after such a high, I know we talk about disappointment, but coming away from the World Cup with such an incredible result, was it then hard to kind of keep getting yourself up for the national team, knowing that there's kind of four years until the next major event? It, the, the great thing about playing for New Zealand is you, you go back, oh, you know, you've been in the New Zealand team, you go back to your mates, it's so much fun, like, it's it's awesome. So you play your club games, it's it's hard, like, you know, it's, it's work, it's a job, you know, and so when you get to play for New Zealand, it's always awesome. But it does take, it, it's, you know, you, you go play, you know, you go play, I don't know, Newcastle, one, one you know, so you fly over the rest of the world and then you go play Solomon Islands. And then knowing that you've got to play Chelsea away on the Saturday, when you fly back, you arrive Friday morning. This is what happened. I actually then went straight to training from Heathrow, warmed up kind of thing, then, then played. So the whole week you're going, I've got, I've got Chelsea, <laughs> like, you know, so now I'll go play Solomon Islands. And it's so bad, but you just don't want to get injured. You don't want to, you kind of just want to get through the game. And so it's not about kind of um, getting up for playing for New Zealand. New Zealand was awesome. It was so much fun playing for New Zealand because you get, you're playing for your mates. Like, you know, they're, everybody's just an awesome dude. And it's just, you know, but you're kind of like, oh, you're traveling. And it's, you know, nobody, when you play Chelsea, the, 200, people, 200 million people around the world don't know you just got off flight, you know, 24 hours before. They, they don't care that, you know, if you get, if you play like a, like a, like crap, they're, they're on you. So it's, um, yeah, so it's not about really kind of getting up for New Zealand. It's kind of prioritized. And, and you kind of prioritize as well. What, what helps New Zealand? What helps that five year old, six year old, seven, eight year old New Zealander who's watching and might potentially become a New Zealand, um, football player or, or a fan of football or something like that. Is it watching somebody playing at Solomon Islands or is it watching on TV, you know, the person playing at Chelsea? Um, so, you know, it's a tough one, right? right? It's, you know. And, and are there external pressures from the club as well? I think I read in the research, in the research for Sam Allardyce suggesting that you retire from international football oh, to yeah. prolong your club career. Like, yeah. is that 
chipping away as well, like actually articulated or just alluded to? Absolutely. And remember, everybody in the world wants your job. And, and you know, so it's like if you don't perform when you're back at your club, then, um, you know, you're, you're under pressure, right? You have international players on the bench. Like, so if you don't come back and perform, or you get, you know, a slight little knock or a niggle or something like that playing against, you know, Indonesia, I don't know who, it's some team that's not very good. In, well, you know, I'd say not very good, but just not at the level of Chelsea, right? Or, or the Premier League. It's like kills you. <laughs> it hurts you. So it's, so it's a real tough one. Right. The, the unofficial story amongst the New Zealand footy public is that you were sort of leading the team at the World Cup. And it was kind of like it, you were the one producing the game plan and the tactics and strategies and you were really driving things. Is there any truth to that? And what was your relationship with Ricky like at the World Cup? It was really good. What I, I had massive issues with New Zealand football um, only because a lot of those guys, and they're lovely people, they're lovely people, but they haven't been at the elite level where they know what it takes to win or you know prepare and things like that. So my thing was well, probably only I have one World Cup. We've got a really good team. So New Zealand football, get your shit together. Make sure it's freaking organised. Make sure it's – and then on day one when we came into camp, it was a shambles. Like, no, no, it wasn't a shambles. It was it was done to the best of the capability of what the, the bandwidth and mindset of what they thought was good preparation. But it wasn't. It was nowhere near the level. I mean, the, the, the stories were uh, – the, the, the farcical. Um, like we play, we play, we play Australia and Sydney. We fly to um, to Frankfurt, and all the bags. We, then we've got a plane to go to Austria, but the plane's a small little plane. So, and we've got to go from terminal to terminal. No, nobody's figured this out, right? So, how many bags does a touring team that's going to a World Cup have? Probably, you know, two hundred bags. Well, who? Who moves all those bags? No, nobody was there. So, so we have to we have to make a chain of players from from <laughs> there to the train, and then the train to the other terminal, then that train to that um, chicken area. So the players have just played Australia, ninety minutes, got on a plane straight away, tight as hell, tight, jet lagged, and you're moving everybody's bags, two hundred odd bags, you know like that. And then when we get to the um, chicken. It's a small plane. So you, can only, you can only take one bag each. So what, what do you do with the other 170 bags? Was that, was that your job, Shay? No, I wasn't on that tour. <laughs> I wasn't on that tour. I think I, I kind of smoothed it out for the Olympics. But these are the little, these were, you know, I referenced it in the opening story. These were the little tidbits of information that, that filtered through and you kind of learned by experience. So by the time I learned a shitload in terms of preparation and, and kind of what to do and how to do it from those experiences. We then go, we ended up having to take only our personal, like, you know, um, boots, shin pads and toiletries, get on this plane, go to there, and they had to bus or, you know, bus the bus the bags on a, on a truck or something like that to, to where we play. But it didn't arrive in time. So we ended up playing Serbia and then we beat them 1-0 and then New Zealand football go, why are you complaining? You, you won. Yeah. Why are you complaining? You know, was what's it, the problem? It? And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like it's, you can't, so it's very hard to explain to people who just don't, haven't been at that level or don't know it. It's not their fault. They just haven't been accustomed to it. So then, and, and, I, and, I, and I called, I called one New Zealand person who was in control of the, the finances, I won't mention his name, and said, I'm going to punch you in the nose and I see you in South Africa. If you don't sort this out, I'm going to punch you in the nose. And if any of the reporters say anything, I'm going to tell them why. And, you know, next thing you know, why? Why would you do that? Like, you know, but he's flying business class and cruising and having the hotels and all that. Then we get to South Africa and and they're, we're having breakfast, lunch and dinner and it's pretty rubbish. Like, you know, it's pretty, you know, crap food. There's nothing. There's nothing. It's like, spaghetti and sauce and that's it you know some burnt chicken and that, that was it 
no, and we're like, and we're like, no, it must be just, you know, second day, third day. And then all of a sudden the players, the players always complain to me, right? They always come to me and they go, what's up with this? What's up with this? And I was like, no, it must be, must be good, you know, because FIFA give 500, roughly about $500 per person, per day, to feed. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 500 bucks, US bucks, right? Mm. So finally I've had enough to go into the chef and go, because I think he's, I think he's pocketing the money, right? I'm going, what the hell is going on? You sort this out. This food is rubbish. What the hell? And the poor guy's going, it's not me. It's not me. My budget. And um, the budget was from like 45 US dollars because New Zealand football had pocketed the $455 um, that FIFA had given them. Unbelievable. So what did you, what do you do with that information? You go to the person who, and say, excuse me, can you please up the, uh, <laughs> up the, uh, and the, yes, I said it in a very nice diplomatic way. Could you please add, add a couple more dollars to the food so we can actually have some decent food? Remember, we're playing a World Cup game in uh, in nine days' time. By the way, I, did, did did many others share your frustrations? Like, was was Ricky Herbert on the same page as you? No, um, Ricky Ricky did Ricky Ricky stayed in his kind of lane, and 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 Ricky was great. Like you know, like he he. He did his thing. He he knew. He knew. He, he probably he knew it. You know, he's an employee of New Zealand football, right? And he wants a job afterwards, so he doesn't want to shake any trees or anything like that. So he kind of, I didn't care. I said, I'm I'm going to have maybe one World Cup. I want to make it the best, and I don't need a job. You know, I don't need New Zealand football. I'm going to back in the print. Like I, I need this right, like to get everybody ready. Yeah, we need this. So I could say what I what I felt was needed to to help win games or help do well. So I look like probably New Zealand football, where um, you know I look like the asshole, right? Because everything was not up to a standard to help. You know, like what in that train of of bags and all that. The German football team turned up. They had their own seven um, their own Airbus plane chartered they, they had massage tables on the plane from germany like that oh sorry they were leaving to go to wherever they were going to go and they had like 50 staff all coming around and all that you know we we were in line with people with with english fans who are going to a, a who are stopping off going to some visa or going to some parties or something like that taking photos of us laughing at us like it was yeah. comical it's like it's a World Cup team. For for what it's worth, Ryan, we've had probably half a dozen um, players that were in that World Cup squad on the podcast, and we always ask about you. And they've always unanimously glowing in their support of yeah the character you had, what you stood up for, and the values you fought for for them. So I'm not sure if that stuff filters back for you, but it might be might be nice for you. Yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah. Look. I... And, and I do, you know, if, if, if you know the manager, if Seamus was on the team, you know, you, you, you you've got to back at you, everybody. You've got to give everybody the opportunity to do their job the the best. When it comes to the World Cup, yeah, if we're playing, if we're playing Papua New Guinea, you know, no, I get it, I get it. Come on, it wasn't a World Cup, right? Like this is this is this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that you could you could do something special that could change that you could be remembered forever. Like you can be remembered forever in these tournaments. The the New Zealand accountants and the and the people up there they want they won't be remembered for this, but we 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 will be. You know, like if you do something well or if you do something bad, if you get beaten five nil every single game, we will be remembered as the as the laughing joke of the World Cup. And and that was that was that was like we which way do you want to go? Going to be remembered positively or negatively? Like and. Bugging me, I, I I wanted you know if the if the kit mate or the manager needed something, I, I I'd, I'd literally make sure everybody was if they needed something, just tell me I'm going to get it done because I knew New Zealand football were a wee bit scared of me because I could I didn't need them and you know I, but the physio he needed he might need the job or the kit mate or something you know the smallest player like like just little silly things like um one of the players got cut you know they had to they had to the cut one player and all that. 
and it was like four or five days before the World Cup. So he's been all the preparation. He's in South Africa. The World Cup's going off. The atmosphere is going off. And now this guy, unfortunately, couldn't make the squad. And so New Zealand say, all right, by the way, here's your ticket going home. <laughs> the guy's crying. So, he's in here. so I get the knock on the door. He cr- comes to meet me and he's crying his eyes out going, I have to leave. This is my greatest moment. I have to leave. So, you know, you, you go and then you go, I think I said to them, I said, if this is a, I'll pay for the guy to stay. If it's a budget thing, I'll pay for him to stay. This is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Come on. Like, you know, just, it's just, and it's little things like that, I think, kind of, you know, you know, they always say little things make a big difference, but they add up. They add up over, you know, you get you get 40, you know, players and then the staff, you get 40 people, and if they've got just a little thing that they need help on, and if all we can get, all those 40 to, you know, and, and take care of that, energy levels are incredible. Everybody smiles just a wee bit more. Everybody's just, their walk is just a wee bit, bit more of a skip in it. You know, it's like, makes a difference. It's, yeah. yeah. You're, you're painting a really vivid picture, Ryan, and I wonder, I've heard you say this in other interviews, that the the 90 minutes was actually the easiest part of the World Cup experience. Like the mental drain off the field obviously took its toll. We had Roland on again, um, and Roland was talking about the medical team being himself, the doctor, and I think the massage therapist, like three, three medical staff on the length of that tour and and he recalls his you know his world cup experience you know he's saying i, I didn't get any of the fanfare i didn't go to any and i know that's not what it's about but yeah the, the 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 mental drain afterwards must have been quite huge oh my god i for for 10, 10 days i was a zombie i i was i was just i was back home in america um I, I, I had my daughter got born, and I couldn't just sit there. It was like one of the greatest moments of my life, and I was just still like a zombie. Like I couldn't get I, – I just couldn't kick out of it. It took me like 10 days to kick out of it. It was just – it was the most draining dra- – like, you know, people say, like, you know, oh, that must be the ma- most amazing experience of my life. I can, I can look back now and really enjoy it because of, you know, blah, blah, blah. But at the time, it was I, – I put far too much pressure on myself. Um, way too much to try and get everything perfect. <laughs> it's never going to be. I tried to get everything perfect. And then actually when you got onto the field, I could just go kind of, oh, fuel. right, let's play. This is play. And they got off it and then something else would turn up and you're like, boom, boom, boom. After, you know. And so at the end of it, I, I, I wouldn't, I didn't really say I enjoyed the experience. Like um, I, I didn't say, you know, I can look back and kind of go now and go, awesome that we we did well and you know people got you know the enjoyment i got out of it was that everybody pretty much had a positive experience like all the players had a positive experience the fans loved it that new zealand fans had a, i presume you guys like enjoyed the times the games and all that you, you know the stories that come back from it makes it just all a billion percent worth you know you know going through it all and that we, we won't keep you much longer because I know we're running over time already, but I, there are a few important things that I want to get to. One of them is your, your coaching journey. So you left QPR to take up the job at Toronto. Lasted about a year and a half, maybe a little bit longer, um, and then the coaching journey appears to have finished. So uh, talk us through that period. Oh, just, you know, I, everybody said I should, should do coaching and all that, and, and, and it came up, and I had a couple of um, businesses that were um, – that were, were in kind of limbo for, for a couple of years and I wanted to get back. And I, I thought, well, this is a pretty good opportunity to give this a go. Didn't do my due diligence on Toronto and everything like that, the squad, and it was an absolute mess. So, you know, I went from, you know, way too quickly from Premier League to actually even a more probably stressful kind of job. And, um, and I didn't enjoy, I didn't enjoy coaching. I didn't really enjoy it. It wasn't for me. Um, um, it was just putting out fires all the time as well. And I, and, and I, oh, goodness. Again, the only time I really enjoyed it was actually on the training field. Um, it was coaching. and um, But um, it, it's not my – it wasn't my personality. And I had a really cool um, um, president at the time, a guy called Tim Lewicki, who was awesome. And he had taken the job as well. And we're talking – and he kind of – Toronto was a bit of a mess at the time. And, um, and he was like, oh, God, you know – 
I don't know if I'm going to be here much longer. And I was like, I, look, I've, I, I cleaned it up. We got, we, they were last. We, we got them to third. We we're quite happy. You know, third, we're going to make the playoffs. And I was like, look, Tim, I think I'm going to, I'm going to call it at the end of the end of the um, season. It's probably not for me. And he goes, well, look, we've got somebody who's uh, who's at the club right now. How about now? Let's do it now, because then he can then get the team to the playoffs. You know, off you go. I'll pay you out because I'm going to leave anyway. <laughs> so, so if you want, to, should we just shake hands and just do it now? And um, so I was like, well, I was pretty miserable. I was, yeah, okay. And so. You know, don't quit because if you quit, you know, you know. So we shook hands and then kind of parted ways and all that. And then ended up the new coach came in and they, and they didn't make the playoffs and all that. But um, but anyway, it was it was one of those ones I just was the top. The timing was all wrong in terms of me, my, my men, mental state, I suppose, to go through it. I didn't manage up very well. Um, that was one big weakness of, of of myself. I kind of went into my own cave. Um. A lot of things I should have done a lot better um, when I look back. But, you know, there's a lot of good stuff that we did. You know, we, as I said, the last we got into third in 18 months, and that was pretty cool. Um, but it just wasn't for me. It just, it just wasn't for me. I just didn't really, really enjoy it. Is that a full stop on the end? There's, there's no – you don't can't see a possible future where you will revisit coaching? No, no. No, I can't. I'd love to. Uh, I mean, you know, I've told Danny and and New Zealand football. If you, if you even need me at any stage, that and the New Zealand women's, um, you know, or any teams, if you even need my help in any way, you've got my number, and I'm here for you guys. And I can, you know, as long as I can bring something to you guys that will help you guys, um, I'm here for you. That's not a problem. But no way would it would it ever be in a in a in you know in a so it sounds like coaching dot end, but dot rugby and dot basketball are really uh, flourishing. So talk to us. It's pretty well documented, but how well is that going? Well, we're just sort of really busy now. We're, we're about to go out kind of globally with it right now. And so I work with FIFA, uh, so FIBA and World Rugby, and we're partners with them. And we've kind of got some, you know, the key stakeholders out now, like, you know, we've got, you know, um, World Dot Rugby, New Zealand, Australia, Springboks, USA, um, all these big ones in basketball. We've got all these all these awesome basketball ones, but we've kept it really tight just for the, the key communities. And look, some people are like, no, oh, I, I don't even know, like you know, like uh, like the Chiefs. You, you know, I don't know what their website, but they could be Chiefs Dot Rugby. Just you know, who who are you and what you do? Your Chiefs, you do rugby. It's just so easy. SEO is really good. Everything's good, but you get some people just going, oh, I don't know. It doesn't make much sense. So, like, but you get some people who just love the blues, like the Auckland blues, you know, blues.co.nz. What is that? Is it sad? Is it you're sad? Is it music? Is it what? What is it? Uh, blues.rugby. It's obvious, right? Um, yeah. So, we're, um, but we're going out globally now. So, um, in, in June 15th of basketball and July 1st of rugby. So, um, yeah, yeah. It'll, be, it'll be a real, it'll real, the next couple of years will be, and we partnered with GoDaddy. GoDaddy came in and, um, the, the big, you know, you've heard, I think you've all heard of Godi. They, they said, we really like what you're doing and they've come in as partners. And and so, um, yeah, so it's going to be a really interesting couple of years, I'll tell you that. It's awesome. G- yeah. given, your, given your love, did you give Dot Cricket a go? Yeah. We tried to go for Dot Cricket, Dot Football and Dot Golf, um, but we couldn't get, we couldn't get the governing bodies boards to, um, to, um, to sign off before the the, the date. Um, Dot Cricket, the CEO was loving it and all that. And so what happened is those ones, um, FIFA, FIFA, we, we literally first meeting was with with the um, with the let's the cleaner. The um, second meeting was with the you know they, they, it went up all the way to to, to Valky, and then Valky wow. goes, okay, okay, guys, now walk away. We're going to do it. And then all the corruption stuff happened, and um, so they didn't apply for it. Uh, it ended up getting to these because in this industry, there's massive venture capitalist type companies own these 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 what they call strings these these top level domains, and they just threw it out to the market, and all these squatters came on and just ruined it. And so those those will never see it. But basketball and rugby are the only two sports that the governing bodies and us control. So the other sports can never ever get those names back for them. Uh, they're all gone. 
Um, but World Rugby and FIBA have had, like, you know, kind of, um, I suppose, statesmanship over it. They have a, they have kind of this government type thing over it. What, what about Dot Podcast? Is that available? Can we maybe look into getting into that? Or Dot Beards? They could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just just one one last thing from me, right? What was up with those terrible haircuts at the Confeds Cup in '99 and? Oh three. I think you, Jacko, JP, all shaved your hair and then dyed it blonde. I think Jacko did leopard spots on his. Jacko, Jacko's a, and he's a good looking bastard, so he pulled it off really well. Guys like <laughs> me who have like a bowling ball head, like we are oh, awful, wasn't it? It was. Um, I, I look, I look back, and I, I, and by the way, I thought it was really cool as well. I thought, oh, yeah, I've got this. This looks awesome. Uh, oh, yeah, 99 was the height of kind of that bleach blonde. And did you have a puka necklace as well at, at um, Stanford? Bound to it. Oh, yeah, the big ones. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. And I was, I was, I was trying, obviously, you can see I was trying, I, I trying my hardest to do, you know, I, obviously, I struggled with girls or something back then. I needed a little help <laughs> I can get. And, and then you can see why I was struggling because all that kind of crap. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, no. Good times, good times. They were um, that that tour actually. I still can't drink tequila to this day because of um, <laughs> the amount of tequila I drank on that Mexican tour. I mean, me and Chris Bukanugi drank uh, probably two bottles of uh, homemade tequila from some guys, and and I woke up and throw up all over myself on a chair. And Books, <laughs> Books, Books was literally. <laughs> I thought it thought the guy was dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw him about six months ago, and he he goes, "Have you ever drunk tequila?" And I was like, "No, I can't." He's like, "No, neither. I can't. I just can't drink tequila from it." <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all got that kryptonite in our locker from some experience. Yeah, exactly. um, I'm 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 the clean up kind of list guy. Uh, I've got a couple of things on mine before we we let you go. RN wines no longer a thing. Oh, that was awesome. It was so much fun, uh-huh. and it was again. We, we're just too, too probably. Um, ahead of our time in a way like kind of you know you know branded kind of wine and all that kind of stuff it went really well we sold it so it was but but just keeping it up was so hard and just as we we're doing quite well we we, we started to get into the stop basketball we've got rugby kind of thought process and we're thinking oh long term you know but I, I tried to get them all into Blackburn and all that and the guy was like oh that's right making it and then the Blackburn commercial guy just 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 called me like Text me um, six months ago um, and goes, oh, by the way, we've got branded Blackburn beer now um, for our fans. <laughs> but your idea was actually pretty good. So, oh. <laughs> um, uh, long-time listeners will know I, I have ambitions of trying to become a player representative. Um, there was a, a new story that you – were you an active player representative, a, a deal where the New York Red Bulls defender went to Chelsea? Yes, yeah, so yeah. – so after coaching, you know, I just saw how there's so many dodgy agents that were coming in and all that. And then when I finished, you know, it's, some people just asked for help. And so we just kind of helped. And then some just, you know, put A and kind of B together. And we kind of, you know, we did a few deals. And then so I just started up a company that and, and, and got other people to kind of run it and just to help um, certain people, you know, get to where they want and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, we've got quite a few friends in the, in the industry and, you know, being in America and Europe, you you kind of know everybody. So, so yeah, we, you know, kind of dabble in that. But, and that's still going. The company's doing really well. And, um, but it's not my day-to-day. I'm not, not very kind of good at it, in all honesty, um, in terms of, like, you know, on the on the day-to-day kind of thing. I let, you know, I just didn't have, don't have time. But, um. But yeah, well, if you need a if you need a New Zealand Pacific Islands representative, I'm I'm, I'm available. Wow, so, yeah, I mean, Winston Riggs should they talk to you? Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sort them out at Melville, no problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but speaking of Melville, you you come from football royalty. Um, we've actually got the Bob Smith Memorial Trophy sitting in Gower Park for um the Chatham Cup 2019, the last time it was held. So Bob Smith's your grandfather. Yep, and my granddad. Yeah, so yeah, he he had a heart attack in the fifties and and died. But um, yeah, he was him and his brothers were um were pretty well. The Smith brothers were, were um well represented in New Zealand football and and everything like that. So um, that's how I ended up playing soccer is because you know mum, my mum wears the pants in our household. My dad's a big rugby guy, 
Um, so <laughs> five years old, I was I was tracked down to the soccer field. But yeah, no. Um, one yeah, as I said, one well, when I cark it and die, it'd be it'd be nice to have a beer with uh, my granddad, who, who's probably watching from somewhere. And, and we tell some old old stories about football. And, and the last one from me, I need to thank you again for the three pairs of football boots you gave me at the Olympics <laughs> in London. I think Nike got the sizes wrong. I uh, I rescued them out of the rubbish bin. I think I still I kept two pairs. One pair had your kids' names on them, I think. So I, <laughs> I gave those to someone in the Solomon Islands. So there's someone knocking about with your kids' names on their feet still. I've still got the firm ground ones, which are actually in circulation at the moment with someone else. So thank you very much for that again. Oh, gee whiz, that's the, that, that's not a problem. Um, but 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 you know, Seamus, you, you were amazing back in those times of experience. Um, you're very good at job, and I'm not saying this because you're a podcast. I don't know about Steve; he's probably rubbish. But but you were uh, you were brilliant at what you did, and um, no, so having that goofy smile was uh, was. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ryan, thank you so much. You've been. An absolute dream guest, someone we've wanted for ages, and you have met those high expectations. It's been the two hours has flown by. So thank you so much for giving us your time, and maybe we can do another one sometime in the future. Yeah, we didn't even get to the Bahrain game. No, that so night, much. That night, well, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do in a part two sometime. Episode 100. There you go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Exactly. That that Bahrain was was a was a beauty as well. Yeah. Don't don't be stuck. Like once I start talking, I can't shut up. You just got to get me going, and then you know, I don't like talking about it um, generally. But because um, uh, you know whatever, it's just in the past. But but when I when you start getting on like this, it's 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 so enjoyable actually kind of thinking back and and all those kind of memories. And so thanks for um kind of bringing those, all those good times, well, most of them were good times, all up again. So, no, thank you too. That was awesome. No worries. Stoked you enjoyed it. Cheers, Ryan.